introduce to you Peter Houlihan, who is the Executive Vice President of Conservation and Biodiversity at XPRIZE. I'll tell you how they've been doing this. Thanks, T. Um, thank you, Bill, Daphne, for the invitation. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you all today. And it's, I, I've been listening to the talks throughout the day and realizing there's so many points of connection along the way but I'll, I'll work to weave into our work at XPRIZE and how we um, how we run competitions. Um, and I'm going to backtrack a little bit. Um, I've been at XPRIZE for just over four years. My background's in entomology, biodiversity monitoring, and tropical rainforests. Um, and so much of what people have mentioned today from uh, different environments around the world, uh, especially rainforests that are obviously so important in ter terms of our planet's terrestrial biodiversity, but they're also extremely vast. And people have talked about um, a number of the different challenges of gathering of evidence in different challenging environments, as well as um, the threat of the threats that we face in terms of biodiversity loss, climate change, um, and the challenge that we're up against in terms of time. And so, um, Throughout my career prior to XPRIZE, I was predominantly leading scientific expeditions, expeditions with local communities um, in different tropical forests around the world to gather this type of evidence uh, to inform policy management and protection of tropical forests. Um, but all of these different areas are extremely vast, understudied, and um, now extremely threatened. Um, and so the complexity of these environments and the data that we need to collect um, I think the challenge of time, so much of what I'll talk about today with XPRIZE is really scalability in light of the temporal and spatial aspects of these environments on land, as well as um, I'll touch a little bit on our work underwater at the end. Um, but throughout all of this as well, I was really happy to hear the dialogue around um, collaboration and partnership with indigenous communities. Obviously around the world, uh, so many people depend directly on the environment for livelihoods, but also have an immense amount of knowledge about the environment and biodiversity and stewardship of, of the land. Um, and so it's how do we incorporate all these different types of uh, science, uh, technologies, wisdom, uh, and, and evidence into our solutions uh, with the time that we have at the scale that we need. Um, when we talk about all of these different threats and the way in which we're being outpaced, um, I think everybody here is obviously aware of that from logging and timber extraction to uh, different forms of mining, agriculture expansion, especially in the Americas, uh, wildlife trafficking in many different forms, um, poaching, and all of these different challenges. And so um, I think for me and for, for XPRIZE, all of this is really background and context. And it was it's kind of nice to go last sometimes because everybody already gave the context. Um, but the way that we gather evidence currently and have for a very long time is extremely time and labor intensive and resource intensive. Um, that's not to say I don't love being in the field. I would much rather at all given times be in the forest, um, but in places like Salonga in the middle of the DRC, the largest forest reserve in Africa, equivalent to the size of about Switzerland, you have 48 park rangers to manage and protect that entire uh, preserved, uh, which is just unwieldy. Um, and in other areas, it's extremely challenging just to get to certain places once uh, to collect the data necessary. But there are a number of places that we all work around the world, whether it's in uh, communities or places where we're able to set up camps. Um, but this model of field biology uh, is extremely challenging to gather the evidence that we need, not only once, but consistently to inform management and policy over time. Um, and of course, it's important. I think I've done a lot of work leading uh, different graduate field programs to teach methodologies for biodiversity monitoring, but then also working to implement that uh, with governments, with uh, our US embassies around the world um, in different remote areas where we need this type of evidence to inform whether it's uh, science and conservation and education or protected area management. Um, and so all of this is, is a little bit of just background as to uh, the, the way in which we collect data being obviously very hands-on um, over time. 
And there is an immense amount of knowledge. And as people mentioned today, there's already an immense amount of publications um, throughout time about biodiversity around the world, about um, our own ecosystems and our planet. But how can we actually scale this and utilize this and integrate this um, evidence into uh, ways to protect, manage, and inform policy and uh, practitioners in, in near real time? So, um, That's really the incentive behind uh, how XPRIZE Rainforest was launched five years ago in 2019. We had a, a donor speaking of funding from the Bra uh, from Brazil, a philanthropic organization called Alana that was extremely frustrated to say the least with the administration at the time in Brazil and um, really all of the many threats both to the, the rainforest, to biodiversity and to the people of the Amazon. Um, and they wanted to figure out ways to incentivize new solutions at scale that could inform with evidence uh, in near, near real time the protection of, of the Amazon and other rainforests around the world. And so a lot of this was really focused on, we have so many different types of technologies that we've used for a long time, for, from camera trapping to GPS collars, to bioacoustics, um, to being able to ascend at different heights now in, in tropical forests, um, install cameras at those levels, and the utilization of drones, and uh, now being able to install different uh, LoRa networks and Wi-Fi networks across forests. And of course, with satellites, uh, now our possibilities are, um, are endless, and we can fly all sorts of drones around the world to be able to monitor these vast areas. Um, going back, 30 years and actually a century, the prize that motivated X Prize, which has now been around for three decades, was the Ortiz Prize. Um, a lot of people don't realize, I didn't know when I joined X Prize, that uh, the Spirit of St. Louis, Charles Lindbergh's flight was a competition. It was a prize of $25,000 for whoever could fly across the Atlantic for the first time. Um, and that really spurred the commercial flight industry, realizing you could fly those distances and um, the sky's the limit. So the first competition that we launched, the Ansari X Prize in 1994, was with that mindset. Um, at that point, so much innovation and space flight, all of it actually was run by governments, um, the NASA's of the world and other space agencies. And the first competition was, could you build as a private citizen your own aircraft, pilot in, into space twice in two weeks and survive? That was the competition. Um, <laughs> for 10 years, the uh, winning technology was invested in by Paul Allen. And when this team won, it was purchased by Richard Branson, and that became uh, what we now know as Virgin Galactic. Um, and in so many different ways, a lot of the um, private space flight industry that we have now, the landers on SpaceX um, rockets were a team from that original X Prize, and so many others have been generated from that. Um, and so it's really an interesting model. When I joined the organization four and a half years ago, I knew nothing about competitions. Um, and it's been amazing to actually see how by running competitions, it fosters collaboration across all of these different sectors that we've seen. It really puts an incentive out there for people to figure out new ways forward, to work together um, in ways that maybe we haven't been incentivized within academia or within governments or within uh, private public sectors. Um, to date, we've launched 30 prizes and awarded uh, or launched over half a billion dollars worth of incentive competitions. Um, and to me, when we talk about scalability, and um, I was mentioning to Bill this morning, I felt like when I joined XPRIZE, I infiltrated this whole other world where I was used to competing for, you know, a couple thousand dollars here and there to piece together to run expeditions or do different scientific research projects. And suddenly we have prizes that are tens to now we have three prizes over $100 million. And if we can direct that into conservation uh, and incentivize solutions in this space, that is a massive win. Um, and I still feel like I've infiltrated and the organization hasn't figured it out, but um, and, and today we wanted to actually understand what is that multiplier effect of um, supporting a prize purse and then down the line, what we've realized is that catalyzes about 33 times the prize purse and investment into the teams, raising awareness, um, scaling solutions and driving, uh, especially the testing. A lot today has mentioned testing, experimenting, piloting uh, 
solutions. And that's really what we focus on at XPRIZE is the rigor behind uh, providing a testing bed so people can uh, trial new things that have never been tested before. And if it works, then that could be the breakthrough that we need in these different fields. Um, in talking about the global biodiversity framework and 30 by 30, a lot of areas throughout it mention the ways in which, because of the time limitation that we have, the number of uh, goals that we need to achieve within this decade, how can we really uh, not only innovate technologies, not only innovate collaborations, but also innovate finance uh, into this space to, to really implement solutions across the world. And so when we launched XPRIZE Rainforest in the end of 2019, uh, the whole point of it was really, could we incentivize teams in 24 hours to see what insights they could produce uh, in near real time? So they have 24 hours to deploy remote and autonomous solutions across 100 hectares that could demonstrate that they could scale this over much larger areas the size of national parks, or indigenous territories, and then in 48 <laughs> hours thereafter, produce a report. So a lot of people mentioned today um, of course, the importance of peer-reviewed articles and journals, um, and also the challenge and the timeline. A lot of times with the expeditions that I showed images from, we would spend months uh, or years on certain projects in the field, probably several <laughs> after that and analyzing data, and then however long after that uh, to actually publish, and who knows if that ecosystem or environment is still there by the time that happens um, to even inform policy or management. So when we launched this prize, we had 300 teams from 70 countries um, and representing all different sectors of academia, different nonprofits, indigenous communities, um, and teams did really work together uh, to develop really comprehensive uh, solutions and approaches. There are a lot of people that started teams with backgrounds like myself or many of you as field biologists that didn't have the engineering or machine learning or your own technologies, and they merged and formed um, these teams together to be sure that they integrated these uh, solutions. Speaking of testing, um, one of the aspects of the competition, the biggest part is the testing. So we had a semifinals actually last year in Singapore. As far as rainforest goes, it's a very easy point of entry into a tropical forest environment. Um, but Singapore wanted to host it because of their uh, focus on innovation um, and, and biodiversity. Um, and I'll segue into a little bit of the innovation of policy that we never really imagined would be necessary um, in, in hosting this competition to host this testing bed. But after Singapore agreed to host this, you know, everybody realized we had 13 teams going to Singapore with 80 different UAVs that had never, many that had never been flown before with all sorts of sensors. Singapore doesn't really allow foreign nationals to pilot drones in the country. Um, they have a very congested airspace, especially over the rainforest in the middle of the country um, where the national parks are. And so it took an immense amount of ingenuity, I think, and patience uh, and collaboration where the country established an interagency task force for expert rainforest in their, at a national level um, across their Ministry of National Development, national parks, their Air Force, civil aviation, customs and immigration, and many other uh, departments and agencies to ensure the success uh, of this competition, just to be able to bring these innovators uh, to the country and be able to have the testing bed to prove that some of these solutions could, could work and be scaled in tropical forests around the world. Um, this ended up being, um, up until what I'll describe later that we're going through right now, um, one of the biggest challenges, uh, but also I think the coolest uh, aspects of innovation in retrospect was figuring out this complex aspect of, okay, we if we incentivize people to come up with these new innovations, how do we actually test them? And how do we uh, convince entire countries that these solutions could then work in other na nations and continents around the world? But to do so, we had to work with the Air Force and civil aviation um, and in, I think, one uh, general in the Air Force mentioned that in 50 years, nobody had ever requested the Air Force to do anything. Um, and they agreed to shut down the airspace over Singapore for our six testing days. Um, <laughs> how popular I was after that, but um, the national park shut down the trails that went through this area because people in Singapore are very active in using and appreciating the nature around them. Um, we had the uh, 
scan all sorts of different technologies throughout the forest that were transmitting different wavelengths that actually interfere with or jam uh, drones. Um, and so it became this really uh, huge endeavor, far bigger than we ever imagined. Um, but in the end, what we realized is the greatest innovation throughout all of this for any solutions to work require people and require collaboration. Um, and that across the entire government of Singapore, our US ambassador in Singapore, um, it really came together in an impressive way. Um, we probably, we definitely could have tested an easier uh, area somewhere else in the world, but um, the fact that between this collaboration of the national park shutting down, um, changing drone laws to just allow the R&D and the testing to happen and um, have people bring these new drones into the country and pilot them, um, and then have people fly them 24 hours through the night um, to deploy different sensors, to do different hyperspectral and LiDAR scans, um, a few different ground robotics that uh, not surprisingly encountered a lot of challenges navigating the forest floor, but this was the opportunity to test them and see if they could work. Um, and so these 13 teams from around the world had that opportunity to test over the um, month of May and June last year, um, all sorts of different, as I mentioned, 80 different UAVs, um, pulling sensors across the forest canopy um, that were, some have cameras that are using machine learning to identify, identify species in real time and light traps at night above the forest. Um, we had all sorts of hyperspectral um, and LIDAR approaches of teams being able to identify many different facets of the tropical forest canopy and species diversity, um, thermal imaging, uh, bioacoustics, um, a lot of advances with eDNA and how people were flying drones across the forest and um, being able to retrieve samples to um, sequence eDNA. So that was a year ago. And um, like I said, it was really impressive to see that level of cooperation and knowing that um, for the finals, we would need that same national level of support. Our sponsor had really wanted us to try to refigure out doing this in Brazil with the new administration. And so we spent the month of August um, last year until we signed a MOU with the presidency of Brazil to announce the finals that I will fly to on a red eye tonight to go to Brazil for the next month. Um, and in this process, there was also other interesting collaborations in ways where the Aviation Authority in Singapore is now partnered with the um, Air Force equivalent, civil aviation equivalent in Brazil um, on different regulatory matters. Um, and throughout all of this, it's been a, a huge endeavor around the world, partnering with indigenous peoples and local communities, um, especially in Brazil. So um, people like Minister Sanya Guajajara, who has been a huge champion of this, also in terms of how can we monitor uh, existing indigenous territories and establish new ones with evidence to support where they should be. Um, so after the finals taking place in Amazonas over the next couple of weeks, we're also signing a number of partnerships with the state of Amazonas, with the state of Acre, um, with USAID in Brazil to really scale these solutions across Brazil uh, in the time ahead to help and support different technologies, support Brazil in achieving its global biodiversity framework goals, and thereafter prove if that can work in a large country and very biodiverse country like Brazil, that other countries can adopt that as well to be able to monitor areas uh, at this scale. So um, I think I'm probably at time. Yeah. Um, and I will leave it there. So mm -hmm. thank you. Time for maybe two quick questions. Hi, that was really interesting. Thank you. Um, I work for Fauna Forum. My name is Anna Becker. And um, one of the questions we are asking ourselves is there are so many amazing opportunities with technology also questions around sort of data justice with that and how do we kind of bridge those two challenges so I was really excited to see you've worked so much with indigenous communities and I wondered how you've kind of factored that into your work we we baked it in from the very beginning so I I joined actually when the pandemic hit everything that I was doing in the field stopped because you could go you could travel anywhere I joined XPRIZE and felt it had just launched and could really come across as a bunch of 
LA tech bros parachuting into the Amazon to pirate data. And if we didn't restructure the framing of it to be co-creation and co-design in partnership with indigenous peoples throughout, you can't just develop things and then say indigenous people would be a beneficiary later on if that's not integrated from the very beginning. So that's been a big process throughout. It's actually a very interesting aspect in doing the finals in Brazil because there are a lot of sensitivities around that, around genetic patrimony. Um, and people are actually, I think, a little bit confused because we've been doing it right from the start and we're realizing, oh, if you do it in this way from the very beginning, like maybe we can't allow different types of work that we haven't in the past 60 years in Brazil. So um, yeah, super important. It's been a core value uh, throughout the whole prize. Wow. We're at time now. Thank you, Peter.